Well, I wanted to invite you to open the Word of God together with me this evening. So thankful that we're able to turn in our Bibles together tonight and open the Word of God. We're going to be turning to Mark and chapter number 12. Mark and chapter number 12. All right, we're going to look here together at a few verses and see some themes that I believe will be helpful for us. Uh, sometimes, I, uh, sometimes when I get up, one of the first things I'll say when I approach the pulpit is to say how excited I am about the message that God has for us this evening. And uh, I thought about saying that tonight, but then I thought, well, the truth be told, if I'm going to be really honest, I was not excited about this message for tonight. <laughs> uh, I was really, uh, I had a, a, a desire to preach in a certain direction, and the Lord put this text on my heart this week, and I couldn't figure out why, and I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't really like this idea, <laughs> not really the message I want to preach this week, Lord, but he wouldn't let it go, and so I thought, well, here we are. Uh, You've got to listen to the Lord. What's the sense of preaching if you're not going to listen to the Lord, right? <laughs> I mean, might as well sit down and be quiet. So I thought, okay, well, I'll pursue the text and let God lead me into a theme through the text, and as I worked on it, God gave me the message we're going to look at tonight, and, and the more I studied into it, I thought re it really ties in well with the message that I brought last week on the least of these, and now that God can work so often through small things, and so I thought, wow, it kind of feels silly to preach this right after I preached that one, Lord, but he, he wouldn't let it go, so I thought, well, okay, I guess I'll deal with that, and uh, this is going to connect with some things going on in the church at this time that I think are really relevant as well, but then this morning, uh, I was listening to... Uh, I have an app on my phone where I use to listen to podcasts. And uh, this morning I was listening to a podcast and it finished playing the episode I was listening to. And the next one that came up was a sermon from another church. And the pastor was preaching on this text <laughs> this morning. <laughs> and this podcast episode was from several weeks ago. And I thought, okay, Lord, <laughs> you made your point. This was the right text for us today. So sometimes it goes that way, how God can direct us. And uh, obviously this is something God has for us tonight. And so I hope it's a blessing as much as I expect God to work. We're going to be uh, continuing a little bit, as I said, with the theme from last week, the power of the smallest things, and we're going to see it from a little bit of a different angle here in Mark chapter number 12 tonight as we look at a very famous story. I'll invite you, if you're able, to join me in standing as we look at this text tonight, Mark 12, and starting with verse number 41. The Word of God says, Then Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for your truth and the power of your word to speak to our hearts and lives tonight. And Lord, as we uh, seek to open this text of scripture, Lord, you are the only one who can work it into our hearts the way it's most needed. And I pray that by your spirit, you would divide severally to each one as you will, and that our hearts would be challenged and directed according to each of our needs. And that as you guide through this message tonight, that we would get our hearts so focused and fixed upon you and your glory and what you intend to do in our lives, that our hearts would be united together to rejoice in what you will do. We pray for your help and guidance in this hour, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. you. may be seated. All right, so we're going to be looking at the text of Scripture before us tonight. The title of the message is Mighty Mites, because we see this widow lady, and certainly, I think if you've been in church much length of time, you've probably heard a text that referenced, or a sermon that referenced this text and the themes of it. And what we see here, of course, is this famous widow lady. So we're going to start off talking about the widow. Uh, she's the uh, character that the story would be most readily identified with. Certainly, I almost said she's the main character of the story, but obviously the main character of every story is Jesus. <laughs> but uh, she is the main non-divine character of the story, this widow lady, and her faithfulness and her love for the Lord, her desire to please the Lord, her desire to honor God with her life and her giving. And so we see here this widow lady. Now, this story is recorded, of course, here in Mark chapter number 12, but it's also recorded in uh, Luke chapter number 21, and what we find there is, is nearly identical. Uh, the situation is recorded there in the beginning of Luke chapter 21. And you can look at it later. It's almost word for word the same story. But one of the words that's a little bit different there is that what we find here in Mark, and we find here uh, that uh, in verse 44, Jesus refers to this widow lady and he says, she of her want 
did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And the word want is used there to refer to her need or her lack. Uh, in Luke 21 and verse 4, you'll find there's a different word used there, and that in our English is the word penury. Now, that's not a word maybe we use very often, but the word penury is synonymous with another English word we would understand uh, a little more commonly, and that is the word poverty. Poverty. So when he's talking here about of her want, it's not just that she wanted to have more in life, it's that she was in a situation of need. Uh, in Psalm 23, the psalmist David is used to the Lord to give us that same word, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that's not just that we want to have more nice things, but that he said, I'm not going to have lack or need of anything in God's great abundance. And so here's this widow lady who is a lady of deep poverty. She had very, very little. Uh, the word poverty can be defined a lot of different ways. And it's very interesting when you look at how poverty is defined. Uh, I didn't get the numbers for you, but if you, if you look online, you can probably find these numbers fairly easily. But if you come to a country like Canada or the United States or European countries where the uh, standard of living is very high, uh, we live in one of the richest countries in the world, and uh, what, what is the definition for the poverty line in a place like Canada is a lot different than what we would call the poverty line in a place like Cambodia, okay? <laughs> or the global poverty line. Those numbers are very, very different. If you took somebody who is at the poverty line in Cambodia and compared them to somebody who's at the poverty line in Canada, the definition is so different <laughs> that somebody uh, living in Canada on the poverty level of Cambodia wouldn't be able to even buy groceries, okay? <laughs> the, the definition of poverty is very different. But what we do find is that God's definition of this lady and his description of her living in poverty is something that is very foreign to our experience here in the West. In modern Canada, poverty here is not like poverty in Bible times. This poor widow lady had very, very little. We find in verse 42 that it says she put into the offering at the temple two mites. And uh, you might have noticed on occasion in the lobby of our church here that we have a couple of widow's mites on the wall there that are to represent and show us a little bit about what those coins would look like from that time in history. Two mites. These are very very small value coins in the time of the Bible. I'll give you a couple of ways to sort of understand the, the value of those coins to try to put them into perspective. Now, we know that uh, you might remember there's a parable that Jesus gave about the workers who came to work in the field and they were promised that they would receive a penny for the, for the day's work. Now, a penny for the day's work, they were a 12-hour workday harvesting in the field and they were to receive a penny. Now, obviously it wasn't an English penny, it was a denarius or something of that nature uh, in the, the currency of that day. So one of those being a day's pay in that story, a mite would equal, uh, there was 128 mites to the penny, okay? So you're looking at a day's pay. If you divide that into 128 pieces, <laughs> that's how much a mite would be. So uh, two mites would be something like, um, I forget, but it's a very small portion if you were to convert that to your day's wage and divide it by 128, that would be a mite. Well, we also find in the New Testament to give us some understanding of how little value you could get from these coins was, we find in Matthew chapter 10, you can look there later, you'll find that he refers to two sparrows being sold for one farthing. And here we see that two mites make a farthing. So if you were to go to the grocery store and buy two sparrows, that would not make lunch, okay? <laughs> I mean, if you were at all hungry, two sparrows does not go very far for a meal. I don't know what they were using the sparrows for, but that's not very much value at all. And so this farthing or two mites was a very, very small value amount of money. And we find that in the end of verse 44, Jesus said that this was all that she had. He says this is even all her living. This was everything she had. Her last two coins, this was it. Now, if we were to give all that we have into an offering, we would have a lot more than two sparrows worth of money. <laughs> uh, we would have a ton of money compared to what she had. And so when we talk about this widow lady who's in poverty, this widow lady was in deeper poverty than anybody in this room. Okay, I have never been in such poverty, except perhaps the day that I was born, I came into this world with nothing, okay? Uh, but soon after that, I was given clothes and given a bed to sleep in and given uh, blankets and uh, clean diapers and a warm house to live in. Uh, obviously, I didn't own all of those things, but 
But we are all very, very blessed compared to this poor widow lady. This was a lady who was in a position of deep poverty and struggle. She had very, very little to give, very, very little that people would expect of her. And yet she wanted to serve the Lord. Here was a widow lady. We know very little about her except that she was in deep poverty and that she was alone. She was a widow lady. Her husband had passed away and here she was left on her own with no one to care for her. We don't know whether she had other family members, but if she did, it's obvious they weren't helping (laughs) because all she had was two little mites, tiny little amount of money. It's obviously she had no help outside of her own resource. And so she was poor and she was alone, looked down on, (laughs) despised, overlooked, probably forgotten by most who knew her and struggling, but God delights in using the least likely to be a blessing. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 last week, that God uses the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. And those of us who might look at ourselves and think, oh, I don't know if I have very much to give, we can be encouraged by this dear widow lady that God can do great things even from those who are struggling. This widow lady wasn't rich, by anybody's standard. I don't think anybody on the planet would say she was rich. I mean, unless you literally had nothing because here she gives away her last two coins and then she had nothing left. So it'd be hard to find her as somebody who was rich. She certainly was not famous. In fact, in the story and here and in Luke, we don't even find a name to attach to this widow lady. She was not prosperous, but yet God used her in an eternal way. That's incredible. Now, I, I think to myself, you know what? Putting two mites into the offering there at the temple, probably nobody did any backflips over that at the temple and said, woohoo, we can finally make budget this month. <laughs> you know, nobody was thinking, ah, we've made it. We finally crossed over the line where we can, we can do great things. We're going to coat the temple in gold this time. You know? <laughs> no, nobody was excited. Anybody would have looked down on that. And yet the difference that was, she was able to make by her faithfulness and her love for the Lord was an eternal difference. Because here we are 2,000 years later without knowing her name or her story uh, beyond this one event, she's still making an impact. And the impact that she has had, can you try to imagine how many Christians in the last 2,000 years have read this story and been challenged and encouraged to do something for God with the little that they had, and they were able to make a difference for eternity, right? They were able to give to missions like we do here and support things like the Children's Home in Cambodia and, and souls being saved over there or even a soul being saved here this morning. What a difference has been made because of this faithful lady and her good testimony. I'll never forget that at one time I was in the Philippines years ago and I ended up taking a trip down to a different island to Mindoro and we visited a church there uh, just passing through. We didn't stay for a service, but as we were passing through, we stopped and visited this church and saw the facilities there and met with the pastor briefly. And I remember seeing on the wall, they had a, a wall of missionary letters uh, from the different missionaries that this church supported. These Filipino people on this, in this poor country, on this little church, on a distant island, they were here and they were giving to missions. And they supported 40 missionaries which I was, oh man, that was a lot of missionaries. I think it was 40 missionaries, something like that. But what I do remember was that they, they sent money to all of these missionaries. And I looked at the prayer letters and they were all over the world. Uh, I think they're probably Filipino missionaries who had gone all over the world. And they were in Africa and Europe and North America and Australia, and Asia. These missionaries they were supporting were all over the world. And you know how much money they were sending to these missionaries every month? If you convert it to our money, they were sending roughly about a dollar a month to each of these missionaries. Because <laughs> that's what they had. They said, we want to support missions. <laughs> we can send a dollar a month. I didn't even cover the postage for the prayer letter to come from France or wherever, <laughs> Australia, right? But these people who had so little wanted to do something for the Lord. That, that reminds me of this widow and her two mites. <laughs> a dollar doesn't go very far when you're supporting a missionary in a far-off country. I mean, they need to eat, right? They need housing. They need different things. But what a blessing to make an eternal impact. And God can use even what we have, though sometimes it's less than we wish it was, to do an amazing thing. The little that we... <laughs> Pastor talked about numbers this morning, and he gave us lots about numbers. I'm going to give you some math this evening. Okay. <laughs> How many of you knew I was a math nerd? Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
if you take two numbers and multiply them, you get a different result, right? So what happens when you multiply 10 times 12? Okay, you get 120. We're not going to get too deep into math. Take a deep breath. I'm not going to call for answers from the floor. <laughs> okay, but you know what happens when you start getting into um, theoretical and uh, complicated math? You get the, the value that is used in mathematics called infinity. Infinity, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not as good at math as I would like to be sometimes, but I do know this, that if you multiply any number by infinity, the answer is infinity. It doesn't matter if you multiply a 6 or a 12 or an 8,000. If you multiply it by infinity, the answer is infinity. And is that not how it is when we combine what we have with God? It doesn't matter if all you've got is two little mites. When you multiply that times infinity, the infinity of our infinite God, it's infinite what God can do with that. Here this little widow lady, 2,000 years ago, cast in these two tiny little mite coins into the, into the offering at the temple. And the supernatural work that has been wrought through that faithful testimony over the last 2,000 years, multitudes of Christians have been inspired by that and said, you know what, I can give to the Lord's work. I can give to missions. I can do something for God's work right now. And those souls that have been saved, who knows how many thousands or millions of souls have been saved because God's people gave because they were inspired by a widow lady and her two mites. Now that sounds like a multiplication that I could not do the math on. I'll give you another math idea. Now this one uh, is not original with me. This comes from one of my favorite books. It's called, a book called Royal Insignia, uh, written by Edwin and Lillian Harvey. And this section here was written by Lillian Harvey, and she's going to give us a little bit of math. I'm going to just read uh, these two paragraphs, and hopefully it comes through clearly for you what she's trying to say. She says, we are not creators, but his creation. We are but zeros in the great world of spiritual mathematics. The zero, however, is very vital if we wish to increase the value of a numeral. It, uh, each zero placed after the numeral increases its worth tenfold until we reach millions, billions, trillions, and so on, right? You add a zero and it increases the value. We are zeros. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. A tremendous truth. When we fell in Adam, we wished to be the creators, the originators, the numerals. But we are nothing, so the Bible states again and again. If we place the zero in front of the numeral, we decrease its value tenfold. It becomes a mere fraction. And the more zeros we place before the numeral, the less its value becomes. On the day of Pentecost, 120 zeros lined up after Christ, and they shook Jerusalem. How many today who profess his name foolishly put themselves in front of Christ, thus lessening his value in the world's eyes without increasing their own value one whit? <laughs> I like that mathematical illustration. You put the zero behind the number where it belongs, and all of a sudden it multiplies tenfold in its power and its influence. But when you put the zero in front of the number... <laughs> It decreases that power a hundredfold, right? And so also, we who are zeros, if we get into the right alignment with our Savior, who is the numeral, the power, the influencer, the creator, so we can be used of him to magnify his work in this world and his uh, influence in the hearts and lives of the people we influence. And so this widow lady, though she was little, a zero in the world's eyes, she was so precious, now, I wanted to see a little bit of a contrast here, and we see the wickedness in the context here as well. Now, you might think that I'm about to address the rich people here in these verses that we just read, but I'm not, because Jesus doesn't condemn them. It just says that some rich people came and cast in much money, and he never condemns them for that. It's okay to be rich. It's okay to give lots. Those aren't bad things. But what we will look to is just before this story, if you look back with me just briefly to verse number 38, Right before Jesus sees this widow lady, he'd been preaching in the temple. And what does he say? Verse 38, And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses. Ah. And for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater 
damnation. So right after he preaches about these who devour widows' houses, we see a story about a widow lady and the little bit that she had and how God used it. Having seen how dear and precious this widow lady is to our great Savior, that his heart <laughs> reached out to her and he saw and he noticed and he, he spoke so highly of her and her faith in the Lord, her love for the Lord, we see how precious she was to the Lord. We can understand the strength of condemnation that Christ would give upon those who would hurt such a one as this. <laughs> this poor widow lady. Here she is, a godly, faithful, wonderful woman who, though she had so little, yet considered it nothing but just a gift to the Lord. And yet there were those in the crowd who instead of being givers, were takers. There are givers in this world and there are takers in this world. <laughs> and uh, boy, these people, can you imagine picking on a poor old widow lady, trying to take what little that she had? She only had literally two pennies to rub together and they wanted to find a way to get, it, get their hands on them. <laughs> and I, I don't think that this widow lady came in and cast those two mites into the treasury because somebody had guilt tripped her into it. These scribes and, and uh, that uh, Christ had warned about these uh, scribes which love to go in long clothing, you know, these fancy guys who love to show off, but really they're just trying to get rich off it. I don't think she was giving because they had tried to twist her arm into it. I think she was giving because she loved the Lord personally, and that's why Jesus was so thankful for her faithfulness. But that was the characteristic of some of these so-called spiritual leaders in that day, that they were takers, not givers. And I'm so thankful that we can see that there's a richness when we labor and we give, we have that generosity, not to be a taker. Not to, don't be a sponge in the world, okay? Sponges can't help it. Their natural instinct is to absorb, <laughs> to suck everything up. You put a sponge near any water, it's going to suck it up and absorb it and hang on to it if at all possible. you got to squeeze to get it out of it, right? Sponges are not givers. Rather, we can be more like a river whose instinct is to flow, <laughs> and an instinct of movement and life and nourishment. We can be those that God uses to be a channel of blessing. Those that God uses to convey his blessings through us to those who have need. Now, if in need, if you have a need, don't be too proud to receive if somebody's trying to be a blessing, okay? <laughs> Sometimes people, you try to be a blessing to somebody, oh no, I couldn't accept, <laughs> okay. If somebody's trying to help, let them help, okay? That's, that, don't be too proud to receive a blessing if you have a need. But we should always be looking to be the giver, not the sponge, not the mooch, not a leech who only sucks the life out of everything that it comes to. We cannot get ahead by greed. And so Christ gives this warning against those who are greedy, those who are leeches, uh, those who are parasites, just sucking on the lifeblood of every creature around them, even the poorest and most vulnerable. And I'm saying that not because I think anybody like that here, but it's in the text, so we'll preach the text. <laughs> but we find here, and this is the most encouraging of the points this evening, and that is the watcher. The watcher. If you look with me at verse number 41, we find that Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld, and beheld. Now, I think it's so precious that here's this poor widow lady overlooked by everybody. So much so that nobody even had bothered to help her. All she had was two mites. Nobody had bothered to give her anything more than that. I don't know where she got the two mites. But she had so, so little. Obviously, she was overlooked by her culture, overlooked by any possible relatives, any neighbors. People had forgotten all about her. They didn't think she was worth it. She didn't think she was notice, noteworthy. And yet he saw all that was going on. This faithful godly lady was seen by the Lord. He saw what was going on. I don't know if she knew that he was watching. And sometimes we don't always remember that God is seeing our faithfulness to him. Sometimes we might feel like we're in some corner, some quiet place doing something that maybe nobody is noticing. But I wanted to encourage you tonight that God is noticing. Your faithfulness to the Lord, your generosity to the Lord's work, your generosity to people around you, your faithfulness to love and to give and to sacrifice and to serve, the Lord sees all of that. Even, even when we don't necessarily think about it, he is watching. And I don't know if she knew that he was watching, but he was watching. 
Now, I'm tempted to take a rabbit trail and emphasize that he was watching the hypocrites too, because <laughs> he knew if some of those other people were giving out of hypocrisy, looking for that greater reputation, looking for the salutations and the attention of others. The Lord knows who's giving for those wrong reasons. But I don't think we have too many of those here, so I'm going to assume that if that's you, that's probably enough said on that matter. Smarten up and, <laughs> and get your heart right. But I wanted us to primarily focus on this great widow lady tonight and see the faithfulness of a godly lady. Here, we too have many givers. And uh, I feel so amazed when sitting down even this week with pastor and the deacons to look over the financial statements from the past 12 months here at the North Country Baptist Church and seeing what, what God has done. Have you looked at those numbers yet? And I look at the crowd around us and I think, man, that was the Lord. That's a lot of what God has done over the, I, I mean, God used a lot of faithful givers to do what God did through this church family this past year. I, it blows my mind. Does it ever blow your mind when you get that, uh, that, uh, number at the end of the year, and you think, Lord, how did I get to give so much? <laughs> what a blessing. And we have such faithful givers in this church, and I, I, I'm so thankful for what God has used this church family to do, not only here locally, but all over the world. It's incredible what God is doing here. And I know Pastor has said many times that he goes and he travels around, and he preaches, and he goes to places to, to talk about what God's doing through the ministries we have in Cambodia. And uh, when he tells people about what our church is able to do with God's grace, uh, they always think it's a much different t type of church than what we have. They think, oh man, there must be a big church. You got hundreds of people in there with all this stuff going on, this big program. But yet yeah, God is at work here. And it's the faithfulness of God's people to be used to the Lord, even though we've, we're not a huge church by the, the size of what might, people might expect. But yet, those who have and those who give and those who labor, God does so much through what we have, and he multiplies it, doesn't he? I mean, if you've looked at the numbers of what ran through the church budget, uh, both here and for our missions last year, it's staggering how we can give a little here and a little there as we're able, and yet God multiplies it. God did so much through our church family in the past year, and it's exciting that we get to have a part in that. And we know that Jesus sees that faithfulness. And I, look, I wished I could have given a million dollars to the ministry last year, but I didn't have it. <laughs> and you did, probably didn't either. But yet what we did have, and we were able to give, God was able to do something with it that will make a difference for eternity. That's incredible. Given that bit to missions every week that we're able to give, give some here and some there, and yet at the end of the year, we see what the souls that were saved in, in countries around the world and certainly here in our own community. Wow. Jesus sees all of that. I wanted to draw your attention to Hebrews 6 and verse 10. This is a great verse. It says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know what? God is not going to forget your work and labor of love. As you and I have a part in God's work by giving, by praying, by serving, by loving, by helping, God's not going to forget any one of that. He sees every part of our labors for him, and he sees those things, and he knows when we are with a heart of faith and humility and yieldedness to the work of God, saying, God, I, I can't do this on my own, but I'm going to trust you to do something with my little. Uh, I've only got a couple mites compared to what other people might have, but yet I'm going to give them and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to labor for you. And it might seem like only a little bit, but I'm going to trust God with it. God sees that. Our faithfulness to the Lord will not go unnoticed. Look, maybe nobody around the world knows who you are. <laughs> Maybe we might be overlooked by people. Maybe people wouldn't think much of what we could do. But you know what? The Lord sees it all. Sometimes things can be anonymous, and I think that it's sometimes that can be helpful. We, um, we used to pass the offering plate around, and sometimes that made things a little more public. You could see if somebody was putting something in or not putting something in. And uh, there's pros and cons to that, I guess. But not passing the plates can sometimes allow our giving to feel a little more anonymous. Uh, we can just slip something in the plate when nobody's looking, or we can also uh, give with e-transfers online. That's how I like to do it. It's very convenient. Uh, and, and those things can be really, really helpful, but sometimes you can feel like, well, I don't know if anybody noticed. I don't know if it made a difference. The Lord noticed, <laughs> and it does make a difference because what little we have, whatever we can put into the hands of God will make a difference. 
I wanted to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll come back to Mark 12, but if we just flip to Matthew chapter 6 briefly, we'll see a couple of verses there that connect with this idea of the, the blessing that comes as we give even unnoticed by men. Matthew 6 verses 1 to 4, Jesus says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You know what? God is so good and gives us this warning to say, look, don't make a big deal of your giving. He's not saying that you can't do giving in the sight of men, but he's saying, don't do it to be seen. <laughs> don't do it to be seen of men. It's all right if somebody sees what you've done for the Lord, but don't do it for that reason. Don't do it to try and get attention. <laughs> Isn't this entertaining? Can you imagine somebody sounding a trumpet just so everybody got to see how generous they were? Sometimes I feel like that when you see something on social media where somebody is like, they, they, they have that, you see these videos of people giving something to some homeless person. I'm thinking, yeah, but you set up the camera and you did all of this and all this production and then you edited the video and then you put, you know, transcripts and, and captions and all subtitles and then you uh, put it on your Facebook and you put it on your TikTok and you put it on your YouTube and you put, oh man, did we all need to see how generous you are? And I understand some of them maybe are doing it to say, hey, let's all be a little more generous. But come on, did you have to use your own face and your own name on that to let us all know how generous you were? And there, there can be some temptation towards corruption in that, can't there? But the Lord says that if you're just giving to be noticed, that's all the reward you're getting. But for those who are giving because they genuinely just want to honor the Lord and want to do what's right and good, when we do it for the sake of the Father, the Father will reward that. You can look there at verse 4. He says, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You know what? God does reward the faithfulness of his people. Here this poor widow lady probably thought nobody was even going to notice what little she put in, but the Lord noticed. And she had praise from the Lord. That was a well done thou good and faithful servant if I ever heard one. <laughs> what a praise to receive from the Lord. So this godly lady was seen by the Lord. And you may sometimes feel overlooked by everybody else. You might feel unknown. You might feel neglected. But you are not neglected by God. <clears throat> God knows and sees. There's another story that shows up in the book of Acts. You might remember the man named Cornelius. He was a Roman soldier, a centurion in Caesarea. He lived down by the seacoast and served in the Roman army. But he was, he was a true pursuer of God. He wanted to know God. He wanted to honor the Lord. He wanted to seek after God. He just didn't know how. But he tried to pray and he tried to serve and he tried to give alms and he tried to help people. He was, he was honoring God the best he knew how. And God, through a course of miracles, sent Peter to preach the gospel to Cornelius. And he got saved. His whole family got saved. He gathered all his friends and relatives to hear the gospel when Peter came. Uh, what a testimony. But I wanted to draw your attention to Acts 10 and verse 31, where God said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. You know what? God remembered th this man and what he had done to help those in need, those who are struggling, those who are poor. Even though, and there's a big controversy around this story in the book of Acts, Peter came and preached to this Gentile and a lot of people got upset. How dare you go and eat with this Gentile? How dare you enter into his house? How dare you give him the gospel of Christ? This is for the Jews. And there was a big controversy over it. But even this man who was so rejected by people who was despised as a heathen dog of a Gentile by certain of the Jews, God had not forgotten his generous, uh, generous gifts to those in need. God remembered it all, even though people would look down and not appreciate him. People would say, oh, he was probably just doing it because he's trying to buy favor with God. Here's this uh, idolatrous heathen thinking to buy his salvation by giving gifts. No, no, he was just a genuine man who was just trying to honor, honor God the best way he knew how. And God gave him clarity eventually, but, uh, but even in his ignorance, trying to do what he thought would please the Lord, God remembered that. 
And even though he was wrong in some areas and maybe he might have goofed up in some things, he had a heart to seek God. And God said, you know what? I'm going to remember that faithful gift of generosity and of kindness. This brings us to our last point, and that is the wisdom that we find in our story. <clears throat> There's wisdom that we can see in the story of this poor widow lady. The first thing we can notice from this is that he sees things different from the way that other people, other people do. <laughs> he doesn't see things the way that we do. Sometimes we can get so caught up in our perspective and our idea, and sometimes I think even this story can sometimes be misconstrued in some ways to uh, what it might mean. But what we can find is that Jesus sees things differently than we do. And you know what that means? It means we're wrong sometimes. <gasps> I'm sorry to offend anybody. <laughs> sometimes we're wrong in the way we see things. That's why we have the Bible, to correct where we're wrong. So we can see, oh, that's not how I see those things. Well, I guess the Lord must be right. So that must not mean I need to adjust my way of looking at things. God saw this widow lady different than everybody else at the temple that day. I bet she wasn't wearing fancy clothes. She probably had very, very poor clothes. Maybe they were a bit dirty, maybe a bit ragged, maybe a bit worn. She probably wasn't too impressive to look at from her appearance. She certainly didn't have a lot of splash <laughs> in her money and in her resources. She might, have, she might have walked with her head down a little bit, maybe a little beaten down by the heartaches and struggles that she'd been through, maybe a little bit intimidated by some of the aggression that maybe people around her might have expressed towards her. Maybe she came in just sort of humbly, just trying to sneak in, and I just want to give this to the Lord and get out of here before anybody you know, criticizes how little I've given. You can imagine these people going, isn't that woman terrible? All she brought was two mites. What a cheapskate, <laughs> right? Sometimes we can get a little overcritical, right? Maybe she was just coming in, just humble, trying to hide and trying to get in and get out and just do what she wanted to do and ser serve the Lord. People saw her differently than Jesus did. And God sees things differently than we do. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Are the heavens higher than the earth? A lot, <laughs> right? So much higher is his thoughts and his ways than our ways and our thoughts. God sees things so much differently and we need to align our perspective with his. Sometimes we can get so caught up in measurements and comparisons instead of just doing what God gave us to do. This widow lady could have made her comparisons. She could have said, oh, I can't give what these other people can give. Maybe it's not worthwhile. Maybe God doesn't even want it. Maybe I can't ever get God's attention. Maybe I couldn't please the Lord. I, I have too little because I can't do what they can do. And maybe they could say, what a waste. Well, she should have stayed home. Two mites. Can't even buy a cookie with that. What a waste. Right? They could have made those comparisons. And they would have both been wrong. Comparison is such a dangerous thing sometimes, isn't it? It can be so toxic to our perspective of our walk with the Lord when we start comparing ourselves with everybody else. That's why the Lord teaches us in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. That's a gracious way of saying they're fools, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's foolish for us to compare ourselves among ourselves and say, oh, I gave more than another person did. <laughs> oh, good for you. Maybe you had more than they had. <laughs> Don't be worried about what everybody else is doing for the Lord. Just do what you can do for the Lord. And maybe it's only two mites that you've got today. That <laughs> you say, Lord, it's not much. It's not enough. God's not looking for you to give enough. He's looking for you to give what he calls you to give. And he doesn't call everybody to give everything. This widow lady gave literally all she had. It doesn't mean that that's what every one of us is to do. We're not all to sell all of our possessions and put them in the offering plate next Sunday. I'm not saying that's what this text is telling us. But what God had for her and in her yieldedness and love for the Lord, she said, you know what? I've only got two mites, but I want to give it to the Lord. This, this giving situation doesn't here, as I said, seem to be a constraint where she was being pushed and pressured into this. And it also doesn't seem to be um, either a tithe that would be obligated 
or the temple tax that would be obligated. This seems to have been a voluntary gift. You look at all the history of all these different gifts and all of the offerings and things. This seems to be a voluntary offering where she just said, you know what? I just want to give something. And so she gave what she had. It certainly wasn't a tithe. <laughs> she gave it all. And we see in that such a love for the Lord, such a faithfulness to her God that she desired to do something for the Lord, little though it was. And so rather than comparing ourselves among ourselves, let's just do what God gave each of us to do. One might be able to do more than another. It doesn't matter. The Lord sees things differently than we do. As we just keep our heads down and push forward and do right, as God has guided us, God can multiply in ways that are unexpected. A little more wisdom here. Proverbs chapter number 11 and verse 24 says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. I remember when I was young, um, maybe <clears throat> my, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years old, for a while, um, being homeschooled, we had all of our education at home and we would have time to uh, have Bible reading together with mom and my siblings. And I remember for a while we would go through and we were reading through the book of Proverbs every month. And so we'd read the proverb, chapter of Proverbs every day and we'd get through it, you know, 12 times in a year. And I don't remember how long we did that, but I do remember that being so influential in my life at that stage of my life. There were certain verses that really took a hold of my heart as we would read through them every month, right? Such wisdom. Man, that's foundational for a young person. And this was one of those verses that really grabbed onto my heart as a young person. I remember that when I was 10 or maybe 12 years old, reading that and thinking, there is a scattereth and yet increaseth? What? That doesn't make sense. And yet, it's the word of God. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet or more than is appropriate, but it tendeth to poverty. Like you could hoard all of your possessions and all of your resources and all of your time and all of your energy to yourself and end up poor. And yet, in God's spiritual economy, as we sow, we're planting seeds for a harvest. And as we talked about last week, the tiniest little seed can sprout up into something amazing. And God's power can take that which we have scattered abroad in our labors, in our giving, in our service. It might feel like two mites. Oh Lord, I don't know if I could do much. Lord, I don't know if I could give much. Lord, I don't know if I got up to teach a class if, or preach a sermon or witness for Christ. I don't know if it'd make much sense to anybody. But you know what? God can use what little we have in ways we would never expect. It's amazing how God has used the little that we have to do amazing things over the last 25 almost years in North Country Baptist Church. And I'm so thankful that God has allowed me and my family to be a part of this church family and to see what God is doing here. It's incredible. God is so good to us to allow us to have a little part in the great work that he is doing. And as we have been faithful as a church family over almost 25 years now, <clears throat> God has done some amazing things with what, we've, what, what resources we have. It doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, you look at what we have and what God has done, it doesn't make any human sense. But yet, there is a God. And as much as we rejoice in what he has done <clears throat> with our two mites, how much more he also rejoices when he sees faithful, cheerful, loving giving from his people. I believe that this lady <clears throat> gave from a spirit of rejoicing, a spirit of love to the Lord because she was commended by the Lord. And so I believe that she did it with the spirit that rejoices the heart of the Lord. <clears throat> oh, I think I forgot. Did I make a slide for this last one? I don't think I have a slide for this one. But uh, you probably are familiar with 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6 where it says that God loveth a cheerful giver, right? A cheerful giver not grudgingly or of necessity, right? And so I believe that this lady was that cheerful giver. She might have only had two mites, but I imagine her smiling her face thinking, this is for you, Lord, I love you. And throwing those two mites into that, that collection box. When we continue to give with that spirit of joy, oh, I get to give to the Lord's work. What a blessing. We give cheerfully and fervently and believingly what great things God can do. And that, I feel like I almost don't need to tell you that because you can look and see how many times over and over and over God has blessed. 
God has multiplied and multiplied the seeds that have been sown. And so I'm not preaching this, night, this tonight necessarily because I feel like we, we need a rebuke because we're all a bunch of stingy, greedy misers because <laughs> I don't see that here in this church family. But to encourage us to keep on trusting the Lord with what we have, to keep on giving, to keep on serving, to keep on laboring, and to see that God has great things in store as we continue to trust him with our two mites. may seem like we've only got a little to offer, especially when we compare to the infinite God to whom we're, we're offering it to, right? He doesn't need anything from us, right? <laughs> he literally has everything. He owns everything. And if he wanted more, he could just make it. Right? He doesn't need us at all. And yet, he allows us to partner in his great work. Our two mites are never too little when we partner with God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord this evening, <clears throat> maybe God spoke to your heart tonight to encourage you. Maybe even as you looked at the record of giving over the last year and you saw what God allowed you to do, maybe God spoke to you about that and said, hey, good job, I saw that. Or maybe he, you looked at it and thought, man, I wished I'd, I wished I'd given a little more. Maybe your life has had a need to grow in faith or in labor or in giving. Or maybe tonight you're asking the Lord to increase your faith to say, Lord, I, I believe I gave what you wanted me to give and I believe I did what you wanted me to do, but Lord, is there more? Would you like to stretch my faith this year for more in 2024? If God touched your heart through the message tonight and you'd like me to pray for you, if you lift your hand tonight, I promise I'll pray for you. Anybody that God spoke to you tonight about one of these themes or something, God spoke to you, amen. Any others tonight? Amen, amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the amazing ways in which you work. Here you have taken a poor, unknown, forgotten widow lady from two millennia ago and you've spoken to us through your word by her testimony. And Lord, if you can work through her, you can work even so through us. Help us, Lord, as we live our lives to trust you, to lean on you, to look to you for the grace that you alone can give. And Lord, may our lives too, when we stand before you in your presence, have made a difference for eternity like hers did. And Lord, help us never to overlook the power of what you can do through what little we might have. And Lord, though we are abundantly blessed here in this country and in this point in history, help us not to be so overwhelmed by comparison to others, seeing what other people are able to do, that we neglect to offer you our lives and our resources. I pray for each tonight who has sense a need and a message from you to their heart, that you would direct them, you would encourage them, you would challenge them to do what it is you have for them to do, and that each of us, before we leave our place in the service tonight, would afresh and anew rededicate ourselves to continue to labor for you, to continue to trust you by faith and believe you for greater things. Pray you'd help us as we close. In Jesus' precious name, amen.